Welcome everyone to the EECS Colloquium for this week. Uh, our speaker this week is Dr. Gerald Friedland. Um, he is the director of the Audio and Multimedia Lab at ICSI, the International Computer Science Institute here in Berkeley. Um, he received his master's degree and his PhD from the Freie Universität uh, Berlin. And uh, at ICSI now, he currently leads a group of researchers uh, focusing on acoustic analysis methods for large-scale video retrieval. Uh, of course, he has uh, extensively published in that field, but he also is the author of a new textbook on multimedia computing published by Cambridge University Press. Um, he's the associate editor for ACM Transactions on Multimedia and IEEE Multimedia Magazine, and the recipient of several research and industry awards, among them the European Academic Software Award and the Multimedia Entrepreneur Award. Um, Gerald. <laughs> No? Can everybody hear me? Good. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and, you know, I want to right away, uh, you know, motivate um, that why is sort of audio important? And it's, it's interesting because when you, when you teach CS10, which I've done a couple of times now, um, you have all kinds of students from all kinds of uh, fields coming and asking, why do I need to learn to program? And the best answer that seems to work best after, you know, trying a couple was, well, you know, you're going to encounter at some point in your career more data than you can chew manually. So you need to program to actually process it. And to motivate this talk, um, at this point in you know, state of the art, you're going to encounter most likely in your career some audio or video data that you've got to chew, chew somehow. And why is that? Well, it's because, you know, Multimedia is completely growing in the internet. So this is a study, it's actually a little old at this point, it's 2013, where um, they basically took routers in the US and they measured what kind of data goes over those routers, right? And you know, I, I can't really, uh, I can't really uh, vouch for this study, but the point is, um, I believe them, um, even though I would interpret the results a little differently. So here's what happens. I mean, Netflix, of course, video is the biggest data, right? So the most bytes go over uh, the routers. So Netflix and YouTube together is about 50% already. And the big headline was that 50% is video data. Well, um, let's take a look. So, you know, we agree that's about 50, right? But then, you know, what goes over iTunes is probably audio and multimedia data. What goes over Amazon is not just book sales, right? It's, of course, their video service. What MPEG means is, you know, motion picture expert groups, the video data. <laughs> and then you never know what runs over SSL. Of course, probably not videos, though. But Hulu is a video service. Um, BitTorrent is usually filled with video and audio data. And what HTTP traffic, of course, makes the big one is, is images and, of course, video. And now I could say, um, and this is usually um, the interesting part of the talk, <laughs> not the interesting part, but one interesting part of the talk, you can think about what other data is as well, right? So the point is that most of the data in the internet right now is actually video and audio data. Of course, a lot of images too. So from that motivation, you know, uh, we have a couple people at ICSI, the, the group that I'm uh, leading, uh, basically concern of research staff, you know, assistants, graduate students, actually Khalid, who's with Kurt Kreutzer, is helping us uh, greatly. Um, and TJ Tsai, who's basically mostly with Morgan, uh, helps us. And then we have uh, visitors. Uh, basically, I have a senior visitor pretty much every time. Li Ping Jing is right now from China, and she came from uh, Mike Mahoney. So he's, he's basically doing big data statistics with us. And of course, we, uh, you know, Curtis directly, uh, sort of, we work with him directly, we work with Dengar here on CS10 and also on privacy. And there's a lot of other externals, and especially Yahoo and Lawrence Livermore Lab, um, which you're going to see quite uh, frequently in my slides. Um, and then lots of undergraduates, um, some I see here. Um, so, you know, we're all interested in, in sort of multimedia, but what is it really that we're interested in? So, basically, we have three main themes. We work on audio mostly, and I will motivate greatly why. <laughs> but we actually use it a lot nowadays, and that's a lot of funding, but also interest, because it's big data, um, a video retrieval. And then we have, basically, we couldn't live with the consequences of our research. <laughs> 
and started a whole project on privacy research because the person who can retrieve videos, you know, and also to retrieve your data. And that means um, we should do something about it because when you know how spooky some of the stuff is that we create, then you become a privacy researcher as well. Um, and uh, mostly, so there's a privacy research part, which is really SATSI EDU, sort of in the NSF sense, uh, uh, SATSI, and then there's the SATSI EDU, sort of the education part too. And some people might know this because, you know, we're using this in CS10 and also at day, we've presented this as 10 principles for online privacy. And there's a whole portal on sort of called teachingprivacy.org where we created sort of computer-based, a uh, computer science-based uh, privacy uh, education. Yeah, so that's, that's just, you know, on the side, I, I can't go deeper in here because, uh, you know, it would be another talk. The other thing that I unfortunately can't go deeper into, but it provides us a little bit of an intuition for what we're doing is location estimation. So this all started a while ago um, when, you know, we looked at Flickr videos and we, we looked at YouTube videos and we were saying, you know, what's interesting about them is if I look at a picture like this or a video, right, you can probably guess where this is from. Any guesses? Some European town. That's, you know, good. It's actually Germany and it's Heidelberg, you know, University of Heidelberg. Um, basically the town. If you ever give a talk there and you come back, then you see that town. So the interesting thing is though, you know, yeah, you can actually do that guess. You can say it's somewhere in Europe and so on. And so we decided, well, you know, let's see how far we can do this with a computer. And, you know, other people have worked in that field as well, especially Alex Efros um, did this image to GPS paper, especially because so many images and videos are geotagged. So we have ground truth data right away. And it was sort of a big data task right away. Also, it gave us very interesting insight into sort of how to do multimodal integration because what you have, and you have a consumer produced video, it, it basically has, you know, tags, right? It has all kinds of information like user and so on. But then of course it has the audio and it has the video. But how do you fuse that data? Because it's like, you can't just throw it all in. Um, so we had, we built an approach and that was actually worked together with Kanan Ramchandran where we did um, sort of belief propagation network that was sort of really smartly using the location sort of F of the nodes as well. And I want to go deep into that as well, but you know, that will be yet another talk. What I can say though, is that um, I was surprised myself, by the way, when, when we did this with the accuracy that you can achieve there. And the accuracy is basically measured on, you know, independent evaluation, which is called media eval. We had 5,000 Flickr videos given to us and they stripped off the geotags. They knew the answer, but we didn't. And then we had the machine guess for 5,000 random Flickr videos where these videos are from based on the images, uh, based on the sort of keyframes, based on uh, audio data, and also based on the tags. And we actually got 10, uh, basically about 15% within 10 meter radius correct. That, by the way, these are identical because GPS is more accurate anyway. Um, and that was really interesting. Um, also, if you look at country accuracy, right, sort of 60, what is that? Yeah, it's about 60%. Um, so it was like, wow, you know, because geotext is about only 3% of the data. That means you can expand the geotech data by another 15% or so. Um, and um, so that research leads us to, oh my God, when you do big, when you do large scale data stuff, that, that does stuff you, you couldn't even think about. And one of the almost famous experiments um, we did was, what can we do with the audio, right? And, you know, we also did a mechanical torque study on how humans do it versus the machine. It's completely different, of course. But one interesting thing was, and that's an experiment I've done many times, and some people might have seen this, so if you've seen this, don't, don't react, <laughs> is if you listen to this, So the first question would be, of course, what is that? Right, any idea? Yes, somebody said train. Right, it's a train. The real question, however, was not what is it, but which city was this recorded in? 
And believe it or not, we trained a system in the classifier based on Flickr videos, um, where you know, each of this was one class. And the astonishing result that we got is that the computer was really sure, really, really sure that this is Tokyo. And we also went in, of course, you know, it was right. But for me, it was no explanation why the hell would this be Tokyo, really. You look, also, you listen to the other videos, they're sometimes strange, sometimes not, but why would this be Tokyo? And I tried this experiment like in this room many, 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 many times. Um, this is now actually five years ago or so. So, you know, I've given some talks because I'm so fascinated by it. And one time, though, somebody in the, in the end of the room stood up and said, oh, that's clear. It's like, oh, cool. Why is that clear? And it's like, well, you know, this is the Shinkansen train. It has it's a super fast train, so it has different tracks. The tracks have a different distance, and they sound very particular. And of course, given the cities you show here, the, the, the prior would be Tokyo. OK, I guess that's the explanation. <laughs> so the interesting thing here about this is, well, you know, the computer can pick up audio stuff that's, or, or learn patterns that are, of course, completely different from, from what we would do. I mean, once you are an expert and know all about you know, trains, you can do it. But of course, uh, how many experts can there be for like, trying to do this on a global scale? So that was very, very interesting, but also that audio can give us cues beyond, we, we can't even say what this is normally, right? Um, so other localization, which is also localization, but on a different scale, we do, I do currently work on, on basically creating a project with Ford Research and also with Freie Universität Berlin, where we have autonomous vehicles and we put um, Kinect cameras on there, but we don't care about the cameras, we care about the four microphones each and they're orthogonal. And so then the car can go and basically um, you know, go and, and, and localize noise. And what you want to do for an autonomous car, if you know, a person yells, you want to actually stop, right? Because um, it's hard to do that anyway. Um, other projects we do is, for example, we have, uh, I have a startup and I work with uh, another startup together, they're called Nightscope. They have robots who roam a mall, they're basically mall cops. And I did this joke uh, at some point talking to them, yeah, you know, you have these awesome sensors like all of the robots which really stop when they hit something. But if there's a mall shooting, you will not find that out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a typical CEO like kind of like tried to, uh, you know, talk over this. But in reality, they called me back a week later and said, yeah, you're right. Um, so now we're doing audio classifiers like car honk, glass break, fire alarm, and so on. And one problem, and I want to point this out, and this is basically, so all of this leads a little bit of intuition into the actual, when I'm going deeper in this talk, is for example, fire alarm. You can train fire alarm many, many, many times. Just basically press that button there and the fire alarm goes off. The problem though is if you go on Flickr, you'll see that if there's a real fire alarm, an actual fire alarm, the acoustic environment is quite different. It's really different. It's not just an alarm going off. You can't just detect a siren. It's, you know, there's, people are like, you know, crowding out of things, people, some people are getting panicked, and all of this, and you want to capture this. And what we don't want to do is create a classifier that basically detects uh, if somebody just presses the button. We want, we want a classifier that detects when actually a fire alarm goes off and there's actually a panic and some stuff is going on. Because otherwise the robot exactly wouldn't detect that one. Um, anyway, that's just basically a little bit of a quick, quick overview of sort of what we do, or what we look into. Um, but I wanted to definitely go deeper on, on sort of the, the, the main topic, which is multimedia retrieval. Um, and so this is basically where we, most people work in the group, but a lot of us is just really my own uh, work. So the point here is again, um, not only do we have all these routers with Netflix and so on, but we have YouTube videos. For example, there's 100K video uploads per day or 72 hours per minute. Um, 72 hours per minute means every minute I'm talking here is another 72 hours. YouTube is not the only portal. UQ, uh, Chinese YouTube, claims about the same number of uploads per day. They're also interesting, by the way, because the Chinese government decided all the videos that are uploaded there need to be transcribed. That is going to create some interesting ground truth at some point, except it's Chinese. Um, Facebook might be a better indicator because they claim video uploads. Of course, nobody really uploads to YouTube, Facebook, but what happens is they link to all the other video sites. But again, you know, this is not super scientific. The point is video 
video uh, data is growing. And again, this is the number from last year. I think I see multimedia 2014. But you know, the year before was 65 and the year before, you know, it's actually growing the growth. So the question though is of course, why do we care, right? So why do we actually care that um, the videos are uploaded? What I'm saying is while consumer produced multimedia allows empirical studies that never before seen scale, if we could actually search, right? The point is, um, and this is an example I'm gonna go through, is right now you want to learn, like, maybe even apply some computer vision algorithms on how babies try to catch a ball. So what do you do? You go say, okay, ooh, baby catching a ball, we need some lab work. So we go get IRB approval <laughs> for highly, uh, you know, uh, for babies, so it's probably difficult. And then you have IRB approval, you go to the infant cognition lab at Berkeley, and uh, they will ask 100 parents, maybe 200 parents, to come in with their babies, and then they'll actually work with them trying to catch a ball. 100 babies will cooperate and after two years of work, you have 100 videos in under lab conditions. Well, in theory, given how many baby videos there are on YouTube, you should get millions just by searching. The problem here is, of course, you don't. And in fact, if you try that, um, I tried that with Google, you can try that right now if you have a laptop. Um, so I was not searching for baby catching a ball because for some reason this actually works better now. You don't see immediately that is actually bad. But we searched for something else, which was giving directions to a location. And that's something our linguists at ICSI studied at some point because they wanted to know cross-culturally, you know, how do people give directions? So in, in Italia, in Italian, the Italians are more like this, right? I don't know, it's hard. Uh, you don't want to be politically incorrect, but the point is people do gesture differently and this is, you know, a, a, a field of study, and of course, right now, you have to go to Japan, you have to go to Italy, you have to go to all these places and film people while they're doing it. And of course, I bet you, when you film people while they're doing it, they're doing it a little bit different than when you just film them, you know, capture this catch casually. So the challenge here is, um, and why does Google work, right, or why does actually any of the image and video searches currently not work, is that they're based on tags, right? Tags are sparse, any language, right, sparse anyway, because an image says more than a thousand words, as we know, and then there will be never a thousand texts. Um, they imply random context, so they upload this for their friends. They, the friends already know what happened, for example, and you, you know, you'll see that. It's like, nobody will ever say, oh, baby catching a ball, you know, for, for the scientist who wants that, right? <laughs> and um, so what I'm, Assuming my work up with hypothesis is if we use the actual audio and video content for search, then we could actually succeed, right? And of course, the, the higher level problem here is that you actually, you know, you can do a string comparison, but you cannot really do a video content comparison, right? So, first thing you need is data, right? That was a little bit of a challenge because if you try to do this on 100 videos, it's a little bit uh, different. So we tried uh, 100 million uh, images and, and one million videos. This is actually all Creative Commons Flickr content. And uh, Flickr was so nice to give this to us. And we then used the compute facilities at Lawrence Livermore Lab to create features and to create uh, all kinds of other metadata that we could. And then we convinced Amazon to actually host those because uh, copying them over is not a matter of a USB stick. Copying them over took months. Um, and so we host them on Amazon. And everybody can now, because the other thing we did is we created a crowd formation template, which is a fancy word for, you know, you can create your own instance and then SSH into it. And we have our programs on there, including basically audio analysis tools, like uh, we have Audio Cafe now, which is sort of a derivative of Cafe, which was done uh, with Quirk Card Science based on CGITs, which um, uh, is the Armando Fox uh, sort of concept of trying to make things easily parallelizable, which is exactly what you need on an Amazon instance in order to do large research. And so this is all on there. And then of course, you need annotations, right? So we went out and annotated uh, basically 10,000 videos or 5,000 videos with sort of concepts you could search for. Um, and this is all now under, under multimediacommons.org. And it's actually also a, a, a communications of the ACM paper pending about all of this. So, now we have infrastructure, right? 
finally. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure what's going on here. OK. So we have infrastructure, but we need to start somewhere when we actually do retrieval research, right? Um, and um, what I don't want to do is text search, but we basically said, okay, let's do audio. Let's start with audio, you know. Why? Well, because A, we have experience. You saw the other projects. It's lower dimensionality, which helps because less data to look at, right? It's, um, as far as I'm concerned, a very underexplored area. Um, and it's, for me, as a result, it would be a useful data source for other tasks. So as I said before, if I find all the real fire alarms going on, then I can use this for the robots, right? Um, the problem is, if you look at, at the properties of consumer-produced videos, and we're going to take a look in a minute, is there are no constraints in anything. You know, not in the angle, number of cameras cutting. By the way, this seems like vision, but in reality, the, sort of the angle of the camera doesn't matter for the microphone as well, right? Um, there is no constraints as of like what quality things are that you are uploaded. So 70% of those videos actually have heavy noise, single to noise ratio is terrible, especially wind, you know, doesn't help. Um, by the way, if you say, oh, awesome for speech recognition, true, except only 50% of the stuff has speech. And this is, by the way, a study we did, we took I don't know, a couple hundred videos and just sampled, just randomly looking at, of course, we can't look at one million. Um, and of course, the other problem is, even if you have the perfect speech recognizer who can deal with this, it will probably be language specific, and these videos are any language. Of course, English is dominant, but a lot of Spanish, and still a little bit of Chinese too, even though they're behind the firewall. 40% uh, is dubbed, so what it means is you have some random music overlapping. Well, not so good if you want to actually study environmental sounds, but you have to live with that. And only about, and that's again Flickr, 3% is professional content which is interesting because in the image realm, it's definitely more. So for Flickr images, it's more, but for Flickr videos, it's not. So let's take a look at one video. This is sort of what you expect, what you get when you look at these videos. Okay, ready? Give it a hug. Ready, give it a hug. Here we go. Camera. Hey, buddy. Here we go. Here it comes. Catch. Oh, I'm Okay, ready again? Here it comes. Oh. Right. Okay, I'm going to stop here if this video goes further. But the interesting point here is um, well, that's real. And it's uh, just to see, you know, contemporary interesting while the, the dad has a hard time getting the kid from the, from the tablet, right? It shows you again, this is like how this is a mirror in today's world. But I'm not so much interested in this right now. I'm interested in the audio signal. And of course, if you listen to it carefully, and it's hard here in this room, and you also need to listen to it a couple of times. But then also, you know, if you know a little bit about audio, you know that the audio signal is compa composed of you know, the actual signal, like sort of the, what happens, hopefully, right? The microphone, right? Because microphones differ. Then the environment. So this is in a room with a carpet, right? Um, and then also there's random other noise. Um, you hear, when you do earphones, you hear a little bit of the iPad actually does some noise. Um, and then there's always other audio. Other audio in this case is all the chatter and, and, and the baby, because what we're really interested in is that baby catching a ball. Yeah? So I'm, of course, giving this example because I gave the example before. How do you find videos of babies catching a ball? And of course, by the way, our compression artifacts are there too, <laughs> right? We haven't even talked about them. And you know, if I, the list, this list can actually be longer, but um, rather than boring you with a list, let's sort of take a look at it's sort of the audio signal. And what you see is, um, yeah, I mean, the room tone, you can subtract it out, you sort of, um, if, you, if you look at a spectrogram, uh, is always there, right? Um, you have the child's whoop, you have the child's voice, you have the male voice, right? It's all there. The actual sound we're looking for <laughs> is maybe 1% of the signal. Right. So it's the, the ball sound. So now you look at this and you say, OK, um, where do we go from here? And in fact, uh, people don't agree on where to go from here. Um, I have one approach, which I'm going to show. Um, other approaches you know, just come from different fields. 
But one way, and this would definitely be the way if you're a sort of speech recognition researcher or EE person, then you say, we get into signal processing. We try to sort of separate the three signals first and do a lot of filtering and do a lot of smart techniques, and then we'll see what, what comes out of it. And you know, I think that's a valid approach. The second approach <laughs> is sort of especially in the deep learning corner, is you ignore all these signal processing issues and you say, have the machine figure this out, do a classifier, just you build a big neural network. Um, there's definitely successes with that. And the other idea is, and you are, you'll see in the end I'm on this camp, you have to do both. You basically you have to do some signal processing and then the machine will figure some stuff out. So let's go through them and this is now, you know, basically a lot of the research I led, but also sort of my research, um, because we've tried this, we tried many of these actually. Um, so first thing we did, um, we tried at some point, was this track with MED evaluation from NIST and uh, sponsored by government. They decided, okay, maybe it's a classification problem. <laughs> so why don't we create, um, in this case, 15, but there are more and more and more classes of videos that show some content like board tricks, feeding an animal, woodworking, birthday party, for example, birthday party versus um, parade, you know, also with this vetting. You know is actually not easy. Um, and then you guys build a classifier. It's like, okay. Um, and I'm just being honest here, we tried that. You know, we tried. Deep, deep learning is the last thing, of course. Uh, we tried also, you know, temple modeling, all kinds of stuff. We tried GMMs. Oh, you know, the, the list of papers here is just three, but there's probably 10. We just tried that. You know, brute force, try to classify. The problem, of course, is it doesn't really work so well. Um, why doesn't it work? Well, because, again, the baby catching a ball noise is like 1%, and you train all the 99% randomness into the classifier, and then people say, maybe you just need a bigger classifier. Maybe you're, they're right. But the point is, then even if it works, why does it work? And a lot of the problem is that we have with the signals, you, you don't even know why things work when they work, so it's hard to optimize. And, but most importantly, the idea doesn't really scale to text search, right? So you now have 15 concepts. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in, in a second anyway. So how many concepts would you have to have to be able to actually do a regular text search? Um, so other work was, for example, track with MED 2010. They went and said, okay, yeah, you can't do it this because it's too noisy. So why don't we take like, for example, these three, making a cake, better in a run, assembling a shelter, completely random by the way, right? Random concepts. Um, and we build classifier ensembles. So we build smaller classifiers that use both the visual as well as, as the, as the uh, acoustic realm and say, you know, person walking, person running would be the visual. And then outdoor, urban, outdoor, rural, again, just basically classifying on the uh, environmental conditions. And you just chain these classifiers. And then depending on which classifiers fire, you say it's one or the other, right? But even then, you know, the problem is here, which classifiers to build is number one problem. <laughs> because uh, we had this PI meeting, it was interesting, and somebody stood up and said, okay, wedding ceremony is easy, just detect the white dress. And I stood there and said, okay, um, how many white dresses are in Indian weddings? And of course the answer is zero. And this is global data. So what are the assumptions you're making over global data? It's really hard, but you have to do them if you build individual classifiers. Um, and then training data, right? So you need to collect all this training data, it's gonna be a lot of work. And then you need to annotate it too. Um, but most importantly, the idea doesn't scale. So, or does it? So Alex Hauptmann wrote a paper saying, no, the idea does scale. <laughs> because you only need about 4,000 classifiers. And um, the interesting point is, yeah, well, it's kind of the, the argument is, we only have about 4,000 words, for words that we communicate with, for example, in English, or Chinese characters, if you know about 4,000, you can read the newspaper. So we need about 4,000 concepts, then we can search for everything. Um, they you know, have a system at CMU that has about 400 classifiers. Um, it's not yet there. Um, maybe but 4,000 will do it. It's hard, I don't know. Um, I have a completely different idea though. And the idea that I had was, okay, look, um, we need to really catch sort of this 
baby catching a ball sound. And we, we figured out in the cheating experiment that if you take baby catching a ball videos manually and extract <laughs> that little snippet of sounds and use that to find other videos, that you will find other videos because that baby catching a ball sound is in fact sort of unique. Okay, so if that's true, um, so I, I used a, a notion from, uh, it's now used in robotics, um, but also super old, uh, of the percepts which is basically just, okay, an impression of an object obtained by the use of the senses. And of course, most people think of object in terms of visual object, but I'm thinking about it like, okay, so for me, one percept would be all the sounds that I perceive when babies are catching a ball, and it means when they're like sort of touching the ball. So the idea is, though, how... There are a wide variety of different balls from fluffy... Ball right. The sound would be quite different, right? Yes, and that's why you need a lot of data to basically get to exact, to hopefully or get to all these sounds for that. Is it different right. whether a baby or a grown up catches a ball? Um, that's a good question. That's all, you know, it's, it is basically this is the approach if you ignore <laughs> all the signal processing. But the point is, um, with enough data, you know, you will never be perfect with this. But with enough data, you can hopefully go and say, okay, so usually when people catch a ball, there's this, this particular sound. I, I missed something before. Yeah. Are you really making use of the context? Because one thing that may be different when baby catches the ball as compared to when a volleyball player plays goal is the cooing of the parents says, you know, watch it, watch it, watch exactly. it. And then, ooh, bravo, and then some clapping. I will, I will explain this in a couple of slides because okay. that's, of course, what helps too, uh -huh. right? Because if you just look for the one sound, we did this in a cheating experiment to just, uh, uh, make sure sort of the approach is it's somehow s useful, but in reality what you need to do is you need to find all the typical sounds and then hopefully that, the, that gives you a concrete description, right? Um, so my idea, and that's basically that, <laughs> is extract sort of audible units, right, from the video, and that would be exactly what you saw, right? So the chill child rule, all of these, right? And the baby catching a ball and all of these. And we, I call them percepts. Um, and then determine which percepts are common across a set of videos that I'm searching for, like baby catching a ball, versus you never, you know, if there's no baby catching a ball, the problem here is, of course, what if the baby doesn't catch the ball, but it's still trying, right? But at least, you know, you, you can get it somehow in better than uh, text that you say, okay, what are the common ones to baby catching a ball versus everything else in the world, right? Um, and of course, the way I want you to think about it is like text document search. This is how sort of Google works in the text world, right? So the way to think about it is you have Moby Dick as a text. The words Moby Dick will appear a couple of times. There will also be texts where the word Moby Dick appears because they're talking about Moby Dick, for example. But then there are texts where it never appears. And that's sort of the point. So in order to really know, Moby Dick is not easy because I chose the example, but there are other words uh, which would classify a certain document, for example, to be you know part of university teaching, versus you know uh, you know stock trading or, or you know completely different topics, um, and this is sort of the same idea here, right? So I, I want to have sort of a similarity unit that allows me to work sort of like words. Um, and that's basically it. So I, I, just as you said, what I want to do is I want to get sort of all the percepts possible. And then I want to say, well, these are sort of more important. These are less important. And then I throw away the less important and do a classification based on everything that I saw. So, but how do I find those? <laughs> how do I find things that are similar in audio, right? So the first thing that comes to mind in the visual domain is kind of like we just we do edge detection or you know even the graph cut or something, but uh, you know you can't just you know roll over a matrix over an audio signal it just doesn't do it you know, um, and if you just create some people had this idea we create a, a neural network that will just fire when there's a change, but given of course the variety of audio signals like they would just create a change this would just way too many parameters. Um, so one thing though is, what's the similarity metric? And there's the good news. Um, I worked in speaker diarization, before, <laughs> and in speaker diarization you have a task where basically you have a meeting 
and you have five people talking and you want the computer to automatically find out who spoke when. Basically, unsupervisedly so. That means you don't know the speakers up front. What it does, it just says, this is different from this speaker. And I was like, well, that's the start. Why don't I take the system, the diarization system, and also, especially because we had in the Power Lab, optimized it to, to, the, to the end, really. I mean, it, it was super slow in the beginning and then using parallelization and sort of one example of in the Power Lab, it went super fast. So it's like, okay, why don't we try the super fast system and, and see what happens. And what's interesting is that there's the similarity metrics and now we're getting pretty deep in, into what's going on. Um, I'll show you the entire slide once. So there's a similarity matrix called BIC. Uh, it's Bayesian Information Criterion. And the idea is you take a segment of audio, and I will say in what form it is in a minute. You take a segment of audio and you train one model for the entire segment. You split the segment and you train one model for the first half and for the second half. And then you ask yourself, you know, what's the number of parameters for the combined model versus you know, A plus B? And if that's the same, um, then actually should be like one thing. And now this is of course just uh, an a information-based uh, uh, criterion, but empirically it has worked super well for sort of this audio distinction task. And also when I look deeply into how the diarization actually works, there was nothing really speaker dependent in there. Nothing was really used that would say these have to be speakers that we're distinguishing. And I changed then the features a little bit. So I went to, so MFCC is male frequency capsule coefficients. It's 19 dimensional. And then you use delta and delta data. And then I used modulation spectrogram features as well because I just figured around see what seems to work best. Um, and again, we used this algorithm and I probably don't have enough time to go into the algorithm, but the idea is it's a glomerative hierarchical clustering. You start with a lot of segments and then you merge until you end uh, and it's certain with a certain amount of segments, right? And um, hopefully, yeah. And, and so then you have all these segments, right? And you ask yourself, okay, what, what do I do with them, right? So for example, questions are, um, how many of these sort of, of these, uh, you know, little, little segments would I need for video classification? Like how many do I need? You know, do I need one, just the children, but also is the, is the dad more important and so on, right? You ask, uh, you ask yourself, what's the frequency of these words, right? You ask yourself, uh, what's the sort of, exactly what's the ambiguity? How do I make this happen that I can actually say, these words all belong to this set and actually distinguish this set from the other set. Um, and then also, how indicative is, is a highly frequent word versus a not so highly frequent word and so on. And guess what? Um, so we, you took a look at them and sometimes you find stuff like that the same word describes more, more percepts. Actually, I haven't introduced, I'm losing a slide here, I think. Okay, but anyway, um, I, can, I can skip that easily, sorry. Um, so we, we come up with stuff that is like sometimes you have the diarization engine split the ball sound into two, you know, even though it should be one. You know, sometimes you have the ball sound plus the baby boob in one, even though it should be two. So you have these problems, which you have in language as well. But the interesting thing is, the first thing that he looked at is the frequency. And what happens is you have this long tail distribution. That means you have a lot of sounds that appear all the time, right? Silence, for example, is one that's really, really apparent, right? Um, also sort of footsteps and so on. A lot of sounds just appear all the time, right? And there's a lot of sounds in there that I can't even identify because again, it's kind of like the train, you don't know. But the interesting thing is, it is this long tail distribution. Um, and it's like, if it's that, you know, and it also behaves like language in some way, why don't you just ignore everything? And um, the other thing that would happen is that um, we have other people, I talked to other people like Big Joe Raj at CMU, Alex Hauptmann, and then also um, we had uh, Alan Hanjelnik at Delft. They all came up with this interesting, we split things into audio pieces and they all look long-tailed, right? They split them all into a little bit different pieces, but they all are long-tailed. And actually I heard this too in Vision at some point, you unsupervised splitting of stuff, you get long-tail distribution. And in the beginning I was like, that's magic, right? But the interesting thing is, um, 
now you can actually go and say, well, let's actually treat them as if they were words. And when I now say words, I mean like words in a text document, right? So like the Moby Dick. And, you know, then you get into a field which is kind of well-defined, which is, you know, document retrieval. And so the first technique that that's sort of every textbook has is called TF-IDF. And TF-IDF, by the way, interestingly enough, does exactly what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do is we want to say how many of these percepts are actually specific to the set of videos versus how many of these percepts appear all over the place. And the interesting thing is that TF-IDF does that. What it does is you basically have the frequency of a word in a certain concept divided by sort of the inter interclass uh, frequency. And so you know a word like A or 2, T-O, appears in every document in English, right? So just discard it. Uh, and then a word like, uh, I don't know, Moby Dick just appears in very few documents. But, a, you know, a word like um, a concept, you know, is only in a certain number of documents. So in the same way, you can now have this trade-off between which audio concepts are in, in one sort of appear all the time, just throw them away, which audio concepts are, are new and really sort of belong to that class. And then what you do is, okay, what we did is we took 300, so we decided now we want 300 percepts, we want 300 words for, for each video. And then it's just the number we came up with. Um, so not one, 300. <laughs> and um, then you have, a, you just be able to classify it, right? So you take the TF-IDF values and you take sort of the percepts and you put that into a classifier. And then you say, okay, uh, we have a new input video um, uh, and we have all 300 words, but we also have already trained a classifier with some videos that we know all baby catching a ball, you know. And uh, then um, we, we find, have the classifier find out whether it belongs to it or not. And of course it works best if you have other classes as well and if you have a negative class because the point is you want to know a threshold. Um, so, um, we tried different classifiers. Um, uh, we used, at the beginning, we used SVM as in the section kernel. Then at some point said, oh, you need to do deep learning. So we did deep learning. Um, they both kind of worked the same way, plus minus accuracy. And it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, deep learning always works a little better. Um, but it was, you know, uh, there's definitely a lot of things that would influence, um, you know, the, the result here way before the classifier. So, um, in the end though, sort of this is what the system looked like. We actually did uh, percept extraction, percept section, and so on. And then um, we did TF-IDF and came up with the SVM. So how good is it, right? So next thing is we actually tried this in a real evaluation. And we got 6% false alarm, 58% miss, just based on the audio. Now it's hard to say how good that is because <laughs> we don't know sort of, for example, how good text searches and so on. We do know though, um, first of all, we basically were better, but this was the good one. I, I show this number because there was an evaluation that back then this was basically way, way beyond the goal that, that, that they wanted to have. But for me, more importantly than the numbers, and you can always work on making the numbers better, was one thing that is really nice. So because we have this ZIF distribution, right? So we, we assume a ZIF distribution. In fact, the way we did it now is instead of assuming a ZIF distribution, you go and say, we make the percept such that in the end you become very, very like a ZIF distribution. So that gives you an optimization criterion on a larger scale to basically say, good percepts are those that give you a real ZIF distribution. That's a good one, we'll see. Having said that, it never decreased the result in the end of the classification. But the other one, it gives you tools in your hand that will allow you to predict some things about the data. And that's interesting because basically allows introspection. So we know uh, that you have this ranking function from the ZIF distribution. Um, and then you, of course, you, you can take the integral. And what's interesting about that is, um, first of all, um, you can say, okay, the top 20%, what if, what if I only use the top 20% of my percepts? It, you know, is the classification then better? So what happens is, Baseline would be I use all the 300, right? So you get missed 72% and false alarm 6%.
But interesting thing is if you get, if you take the top 20, we actually got false alarm 6% and miss 66%. So it was better. So with less data, you get better results, right? Because we filtered out the stuff that wasn't so interesting. Um, of course, you need to do the counter experiment as well. And the counter experiment was, okay, let's use the lowest scoring uh, percepts. And the lowest scoring percepts went to 6%, 79%. Uh, uh, um, so it actually went worse. Now you could say, well, it's not a big difference though. Well, first of all, these are 150,000 videos, so it's not, <laughs> not insignificant. But the other thing is, I agree with you. Um, it's not perfect. We should definitely work on making that difference way better. Because the point here is, if you think about the top 20, these should be really distinguishable percepts, you know, while the low 20 should be really just garbage. Right? Uh, I'm missing the experiment that you ran. So you had 150,000 videos? Yeah, so what do you do? Training set of how uh, Yeah, so that was basically, we have different classes. Um, so we had 150,000 videos and there were a couple hundred videos per class, right? 15 classes. Uh, so training set is 100 videos per class. And 150 is what you have to classify, what you have to have the result in, right? So in the 150,000 videos, sorry, 150,000 videos, they belong either to a class, one of the 15, or to no class, right? And so what you do then is you do everything I said, except instead of training the classifier with 300, you train them just with the top 20 TFID. I that, but I, yeah. The overall experiment, so you had ground truth. How do, how do you know which? Yeah, uh, ground truth was annotated by, uh, at this point, um, LDC, Ling Linguistic Data Consortium. Okay. They had three. Videos that they had. Yes. <laughs> and how many of them ended up in that none of the above bucket? Um, I think about 5,000 were, were basically part of this. So that means 145 ended up in none of the above. 145,000 ended up in none of the above. Yes. So, so when you miss, that means, well, so no, I'm not so. False alarm and miss, I'm not familiar with that terminology. I'm assuming it's, it's, it's false positive and false negative. Oh, so it's easy. For, for, okay, so first of all, that's why I also show ER. But false alarm means you say a video belongs to a class even though it doesn't, right? And um, miss means the video belongs to the class but you didn't find it. So it's false positive and false negative. Yeah. And equal error rate is if you tune your system to the point where you have false alarm equals uh, miss rate. This is frequently done because the idea is here that it gives you one number to compare. Okay, but uh, so, so take the baseline. So seventy-two percent are false negatives. So that's if it belonged to one of the fifteen classes, but you misclassified it. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. So exactly. So you said that, that no, seventy-two percent misses means we went through the videos yeah. and they should actually belong into one of the classes, but we didn't find it. Okay, but I thought you said that 145,000 didn't fit into any of the classes. Yes. So uh, how is that so? No, no, no. Uh, basically, the 155,000 can only generate false alarms. The, the 5,000 can generate the misses. So of the 5,000, 72% of the time? Yes. Right. Which is not good. You know, I'm not saying this is super good. But uh, compared to, and I will show you in a bit, compared to what text-based search does, it beats the heck out of it. Um, so the other idea that we did is, um, so the interesting thing is you have this uh, below the curve. I don't know if I probably don't have time for this. I'm, I'm skipping this. Because what you can is you can predict sort of your, your, your uh, descriptiveness of, of the set that you have. But what's interesting is, we work with audio, but in reality, there's also images attached, right? And what we wanted to know is, how does the top number one percept, what is the image that corresponds to that, you know, if you take one, actually look like? And we just took a couple random, and these are some screenshots. So this is working on a woodworking project. This is landing a fish. And this is uh, grooming an animal, actually, but it's feeding at this point. Okay, let's not be too <laughs> accurate. But we were really, really happy because here now, I mean, landing a fish, this is the exact moment of, right? And this is basically exactly what we're working on, which is like catching the ball. You want the exact moment of 
catching the ball. Um, and that was kind of nice, uh, because also for the first time, we can now look at stuff and say, okay, what about the stuff in the middle? What about these low percepts? How do they look like? And if they're completely off, then you know that. And in fact, we did that, and unfortunately don't have time for that. Um, we, did, we did a mechanical torque thing where we sort of wanted to see how, how well do they, do they match. And then you can use that also to tune, which is way better than just basically tune on the zip curve. I want to show you a little demo. So this is a search engine that we actually implemented with uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab together and Sichuan University. Sichuan did uh, a lot of the visual stuff. Um, and so these were visitors. Let me just play that. Um, does it play? Yeah. So what happens here in this one, it was just a couple of classes. You could uh, 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 get this from. But what it does is, first, first thing you do is you actually do a regular search. And then you find some videos and you go through the videos. This is the video stream and click on them, it's super fast, I'm sorry. You click on them, and then they go in here. And then using, this is already, so that was too fast. Using those videos that you click on here, oh, here we go. Um, it refines the search, right? So you get from next step to next step to next step to next step, it makes it sort of interactive. Um, and while the first search is based on um, uh, the text, the next search, this one already, is based on images and video features, uh, and um, video and audio features, of course. Um, I, I, there's a lot of, they use SIFT and they use dif different features in the visual domain, but the, the audio stuff from us is in there, and it, you know, if you use it, and the interesting thing is with the Flickr data we have, you can directly compare to a snapshot of April 24th, 2014, uh, how Flickr does versus how we do, and, um, you know, you just get way more results doing that. That's basically what it is. So, um, there are a couple open questions. I mean, way too many that I can discuss right now. Um, the bad thing here is I used only audio. I should have used, you know, <laughs> audio and video and everything early. That would be my ideal. Uh, we, these percepts were kind of arbitrary based on the ideas that I have. There should definitely be a deeper study on how to do them. Um, What's the optimal percept is my question. How can we tune them really? I mean, tune really just on the zip curve? I don't know. Uh, how can we exploit the temporal dimension better, right? So that idea was here before, but the other idea is like, hmm, if a baby catches a ball, the baby probably is very positively surprised about it. So there's probably a whoop. So basically, you know, it's gonna be catch plus something. The other typical uh, textbook example is, you know, a thunderstorm is usually lightning plus delay plus Boom, so you should basically have some temporal modeling there, which we don't have at all. We use it as back of words, right? And the other thing that I'm really interested in, now that we have a million videos, the problem is a million videos is just 10 days of YouTube, really. But in reality, it's a million already. So is there a universal set of percepts? In theory, if I run the uh, percept extraction on the entire set, is there a finite set? And is that finite set maybe just 4,000, 8,000? That would be fun, right? Because then we could actually prove the theory uh, that you don't have so many. The problem is percepts and concepts are also different. Um, in, in the bigger picture, what's interesting here is also, we always have this conflict between sort of going into single processing deeply, and then also just saying, I ignore it and just classify, right? So the question is, what's true here? I, I guess there's, it's, you know, I can easily have big discussions about that. Um, and then, Again, in the end, you know, it's, I think audio is an under-worked under, uh, topic, and there's a lot of uh, intricacies, there that, intricacies there that are sort of really different from what, what you do in image or in, in other data. Um, and in the end is, you know, of course the end goal is you finally want to do something that's not just, again, tested on 150,000 videos, or maybe tested there, but in reality really working for everything you feed it. Right? And with more and more and more and more and more data coming, maybe at some point we can actually achieve that goal. When, you know, when it works against a million videos, that definitely tells you something versus it works against, I don't know, 10, right? Um, but this is sort of, you know, where, where I want to go with this. Um, apart from the fact that, of course, we're doing privacy work as well, and we know that, you know, we can now detect homes to break in <laughs> more easily too, which is another talk, another issue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a 
little over time, but maybe we have uh, one or two questions from the audience. So, I'm not quite understanding in this context what's the meaning of signal processing and why is it not part of the big data and how is it different filters to look at hybrid? To look okay, at so, okay, maybe, okay, the context here is, or what I have in mind when I say this, is there's Andrew Eng. Uh, coming and saying, oh, you don't need to extract audio features anymore. Just put, take the waveform assist and train a neural network with deep learning. Um, and I'm not saying this is wrong because actually they had some good results using that. The question though is, um, are these results really general? Um, and in fact, what we found is that we can train, uh, you know, for example, a speech recognizer with with a neural network uh, such that you don't need features anymore, but that done, then actually it doesn't generalize as well to new data. Um, and since this is such a humongous amount of data, we can actually try this ultimately, right? Sorry, I don't understand the concept of having no features. Could you elaborate, like, uh, features just some sort of property attached to the thing? Oh, okay. What, what would you have instead of a feature? I'm missing something. Okay, yeah, Not so. Not very trained in machine learning. <laughs> yeah, so no problem. So usually when you have a waveform, when you record audio, you have a waveform, right? So it's just, you know, values that is basically amplitude over time. So you could feed that. Or, of course, the next question is, can you feed, you know, the frequency space, right? And so what these audio features do is, the male frequency capsule coefficients are actually very interesting features. What they do is they convert into frequency space, then they do some transformations that are actually sort of loosely connected to the human ear, um, which is sort of logarithmic scaling, for example. And then they actually do, which is totally weird, which is why they're called capsule, another DCT of that frequency space. Um, and they do that because back then, in the days, they couldn't do a PCA or something to reduce the, the values. So what they do is they, they come from 400, 10 milliseconds would be 400 and, uh, 441, 441 samples um, to 12 samples. And when I say MFCC 19, I do a little different where you get to 19 sample points, right? So reduce the data a lot, you know, trying to focus on what's important in the data. But isn't that still... A Effectively feature extraction. That is feature extraction. I'm okay. saying feature extraction. That is feature extraction. Okay. And, and of course the point is here, you say, okay, you do all this manual engineering of the feature extraction, um, but why doesn't the machine just do it? You know, we just add some layers in your neural network and then this feature extraction will come out automatically. Oh, I see. So you're saying the question really is, is the feature extraction manual or automated? Exactly. Okay, so that's really not I think I have a different version of the same question. Which is, can you give us some, is there some intuition for what these precepts are capturing? So, for example, in image processing, if you say SIFT, uh, SIFT vectors as features, right? You, there's some intuition that it's capturing, you know, changes in texture and things like that. I mean, yeah. what are these precepts capturing? Yeah, so we, that is, very good question, actually. So, two things. First of all, we do malfrequency, mostly. And malfrequency uh, capsule coefficients, what they do is they capture basically the changes in the frequency space. Okay, so like what is changing in the frequency space? Um, so, unfortunately, these features are not reversible because, again, you go from 441 values to 19, it's pretty hard to go back. Um, um, that's why we, and that's also an interesting chance for, for this whole thing, is we correlated them with the video part. Um, and the problem, though, is that sometimes it works really well, especially the first percepts, the highest frequency percepts work really well. I mean, I could repeat that many, many times, what, I, what you saw there. But then once you get to the lower frequencies, like even the top three, top four, top five, it starts to be a little weird. Having said that, we tried the mechanical torque experiment, and we played audio to users, and they had the same problem. <laughs> And we did the mechanical Turk experiment and played audio with video, and then it's easier, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. But um, so the intuition mostly comes from, um, I mean, what we do know is we, what we can do is because, of course, these percepts, we know where in the audio the times are, we can play that audio back. And often it's really like, right? Like, it's like, okay, fine. And that's a door. Yeah. Are there are no more questions. Let's thank our speaker again.
See you next Thank week, you. same time. <laughs>